So why is it that the election polls and the election results don't always match up? Well, I have some of the most common errors you're going to see in polling to help you understand why those numbers sometimes don't always work. And the first thing you might see is what we call a sampling error. A sampling error is basically when the people you choose for your sample, like the people you're going to ask, don't actually represent the whole population. So here I have an example. This is a population of 20 people, okay? So there's seven reds, which is 35%. There's three greens, which is 15% of the population. There's five purples, 25% of the population. Five blues, 25% of the population. So that is what they represent for the whole population. However, election people, pollsters, they cannot ask everybody in the entire population. We can't ask all 100, 330 million people or whatever. So they do is they take a sample. A sample is a sample. We take a little piece of each one of these different groups that are here to come up with a sample that represents to our best of our abilities, our population, okay? And what happens when you have sampling errors is sometimes the samples you pick don't actually represent the population. So for example, here, we have examples of oversampling and undersampling, okay? So here we, in the reds, there's oversampling, because here, seven out of the 20 of the population, or 35%, are green. Now, I'm only gonna survey five people here, so I say, oh, well, red's the biggest one, so I'll let them have two. Well, two in the sample of five is actually 40%. So though they're 35% of the whole population, in the survey, in the sample, they count as 40%. So they're oversampled. In the sample, they are a bigger percentage than what they are in the actual population. Okay, follow me there? And it can work the other way as well. For example, the purples and the blues, they are 25% of the population each. However, if I'm only gonna have five, and I wanna make sure everybody's on there, I got two for the red, one for the green, one for the purple, one for the blue. So the purples, they have one out of the five. In the sample, they're only representing 20% of the sample, okay? Whereas in the population, they're 25%. That means that there's 5% of them, that population that isn't represented, so it's underrepresented, okay? So that's what you have this idea of the overrepresented in the sample or oversampled means in the sample, they're a bigger percentage than the actual population is, and undersampled is, oh, they're getting a smaller percentage than what the actual population is, okay? So how can I improve so I don't have these sampling errors or the sampling error might be a little bit less? Well, sometimes what you wanna do is actually add more people into the sample, like a bigger sample size, so you can get those percentages a little bit closer. So now what I've done is actually now I have 11 of the people in here, so now I assign, oh, well I have four red, which four red are this is 36%, oh, just a little bit, 1% over the over sample, 1%, that's not too bad, I'm okay with that. Green, oh, green's not gonna be very happy. I kept them at one, now they're only 9% of the sample versus 15% of the population. Now, is that better? Well, for them, it's worse. But I might say, well, that's a very small group. It's the smallest group here. Maybe it doesn't matter as much. It's up to you how they kind of term these things. Because then, And then I look at the blue and purple and see that, hey, they're each three. So now that makes 27%, which is closer to that 25% than the 20. Now, you, now you notice we have a, still have a little bit of oversampling here and here and here, but 1%, 2%, 2%. So I feel those are a little bit closer, but then I see oh, the green now that's only 9%. So you see the oversampling and undersampling, like these things are gonna happen pretty much no matter what happens until you literally ask everyone, which you can't really do because it costs too much. It's a lot of effort to get 330 million, you know, people to uh, respond to a survey. So that's one thing you have to think about. So there's the oversampling, undersampling, just the sampling errors, very common thing. Another error you're gonna see is actually what we call a non-response bias. These are people that just don't respond. I mean, think about it. Who's answering the phone from a random phone number that calls at two o'clock in the afternoon? I'm teaching class. I can't answer a phone call. And if I don't know who it is, unless it's my kid's school, I'm not answering it. And so you have to think about that. How do we factor that in? Are there non-response? Are there people that aren't there? Like maybe it is the, the purples. The purples don't like cell phones. So they don't answer cell phone calls. So how do I get them in there if they're not going to answer their phone call? That's why when you put it non-response, we got to think about how can we get them to respond. So those pollsters have to go back and get people. That's why you might see young people might be underrepresented or older people or different demographics might be underrepresented. And that's why we say, hey, look, we want to make sure if they're not answering, we want to go out there and get people in that's purple or the blue or the green or the red that fit in there that haven't responded, we wanna get them to respond, okay? Because when they don't answer, it's not like we can't count them because we see they're still part of the population. So that's another thing is that non-response bias you might see. 
Now, another typical area you might see is, so I guess you'd call it the question wording bias, okay? How you ask the question can really influence how people answer. Like, if I ask you a question of, oh, what do you think about this wonderful, fantastic person? Well, you're probably gonna say something really nice about them. If I say, what do you think about this smelly, stinky person? you're probably gonna say something bad just by the way you word the question. And sometimes that does happen. That's why it's really important for pollsters to very, use very neutral thing. What do you think about candidate X? What do you think about candidate Y? You know, nothing else because otherwise you can taint what they say. You know, that's why it's really important to use that neutral language because the wording, that's why it's really easy to get people to answer however you want because you just make the question in a way that they'd have to say no or they'd have to say yes. Now, another error you'll probably see is the timing error. This is one thing that you have to realize it's really important to ask, when was this poll done? Because has there been new information that's come out since that poll? It can really impact how polls are. That's why looking at, you know, if you're a presidential election, there's no reason to look at the June or July polls because that doesn't really necessarily impact what the polls are saying in October or, you know, the 1st of November. So that's really important is that recency is very important because the farther it goes back, there might be more people that haven't made their decision yet. So there could be, I don't know, or undecided, or they could change. That's why politicians like to get the word out. They like to talk to people so that people can make a decision. That's why when you get closer to the election date, that more recency to the actual election, it's usually closer than when you're two or three months out. That's why when you ever watch any of the news programs, they'll show like, oh, in August it was this, and early September it was this, and late September, early October, late October, they're showing they're looking for trends in there because it gives them a better idea of how things are moving. Because the closer you get to election date, the more kind of closer those results are gonna be because people have made their decisions. Now, another error you might see is what we call a waiting error. And a waiting error is basically how we weight these things. Now here, I just did a straight you know, percentage. Oh, oh, seven out of 20 is 35%. Three out of 20 is 15%. You can do that, but sometimes what you want to do is you want to weight it in more realistic settings. Like, okay, this is the actual population, but maybe I want to weight it so it goes for likely voters. I see, oh, the reds are 100% likely to vote and the green is 0% likely to vote. Obviously, that's going to impact it more, right? It's like, oh, well, they're really going to vote. I probably want to put their votes higher and like make them weightier in our sample than ones that aren't going to vote. And that's another thing that's really tough to see is like you look at historical trends. Who has voted? Who hasn't voted? Who's going to vote? Who said they're going to vote? You put that in to kind of figure out what the weights are. And that's one of the big reasons why you might see very differences in polls and elections coming up to it because how they decide how to weight things. So those are just five common errors you see when pollsters are doing election polling. There are other errors out there. I'm sure of that. I'm sure you've seen it. You can put them down below, discuss them all you want. Keep it civil, please. But that's one of those things. I wanted to help people understand that sometimes it's not that anybody's trying to be mean or skew the data. It's just sometimes we can't always get the numbers to work, so we do our best. And that's what pollsters are trying to do, okay? So what are some questions that you have about election polling? Please put it down in the comments below so I can help out. And for those wondering why is Professor Walters talking about, you know, election stuff, it's because my students actually asked me, Professor Walters, what's up with election polling? So I thought I'd help them out. All the best. Bye.